Good day, everyone, and welcome back to another Lanfrica Talks series. Today, we have an amazing talk from Stephen, who will talk to us about sign to speech model for sign language understanding, a case study of Nigerian sign language. Stephen is a computer science undergraduate in his final semester and an independent machine learning researcher with ML Collective. His research generally focuses on exploring efficiency problems from algorithm, method, data, and system perspectives. His main goal is to increase accessibility in the shaping of the technologies that we build and use. Thank you very much, Stephen, and the floor is yours. All right, um, thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for, the, for the warm introduction. And, uh, uh, and I'll get started now, yeah. So uh, hi everyone, as Chris mentioned, I'll be speaking on my work, you know, trying to uh, explore sign language understanding using uh, the Nigerian sign language as a case study. Um, just to be sure that I'm, I am very audible. Uh, Chris, can you just uh, say something? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right, so um, I had a um, couple of collaborators who are working on this. Uh, there was OpaYemi, Osakwadi, there was uh, Naya Saxena, and then um, Dr. Babatunde Ulushade. Yeah, but more information on them later. Yeah. Okay, so um, just, just before we start, um, I like to reflect a little bit on how far we've come, you know, in, um, in the development of uh, machine learning uh, generally, right? And um, this, this was back in, uh, back in the uh, 19th century. Uh, when the world was still powered by uh, steam engine, uh, steam technology. So um, this is an SG post machine, you know, you um, push in the data from one end and then you, know, you get the results, um, which is like, um, you know, you get your model and then you basically pass in you know, inputs you know, to get predictions later on. And, uh, yeah, I think this is really cool. <laughs> okay, okay, this is actually a joke, but um, uh, I've realized that um, it's a very good way for me to estimate the uh, the uh, proficiency of my audience, you know, uh, with machine learning generally. Yeah. So suppose this is a physical talk, then maybe I would ask you to raise your hand, you know, if, if you get the joke <laughs> or not. Yeah. So um, that way I know uh, <laughs> how how much high level you know I could go in explaining some of the concepts in this uh, in this talk. Okay, so um, this project started out as a fun project. Uh, there was this um, challenge on Twitter uh, by Vista AI, and um, and I, I start to you know build uh, uh, an end-to-end -end working prototype that can detect sign sign language meanings in images and videos, you know, and then generate an equivalent of voice of words. So the way I did this was that um, I went online and then I. I mean, there's like abundance of resources on American sign languages. So I learned eight words, I mean, eight phrases generally, yeah. And then after learning the eight phrases, I used that, I, I wrote a script, I wrote a Python script that automatically opened up my uh, webcam and then create a data set, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that, that was, I had my data set and that was what I used for my um, initial training, yeah. And I had this. Um, so I won the challenge and uh, the success of it was like a, you know, a huge confidence boost for me. And as at that time, I was just getting into research. So I I decided to talk with a couple of my friends who were already into research, you know, and see if I could explore, I mean, scaling up this project into something bigger, something more meaningful. So the first person I talked to was uh, Okpaya. So she was uh, a researcher at Data Science Nigeria back then. Uh, currently, she's she, she's a PhD researcher at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so we talked about it. We had a really long conversation about it. Uh, she suggested that yes, we could do this, and then yeah, we started. Um, we started um, trying to do the show with the frequency what has been done in this particular field, and then I also had a mentor. Um, uh, given to me by Data Science Nigeria. I was once a community leader of Data Science Nigeria. So um, 
Dr. Babatunde Olusha is like he's a senior lecturer of uh, data science and software engineering at Cardinal Polytechnic University. So I discussed this with him, and then he was very enthusiastic about it. And yeah, so more literature reviews, and uh, we like starting our literature reviews. Uh, there's been a lot of work that have been done on um, on sign languages in the in the uh, in the global north. I mean, yeah. I mean, American sign language, the British sign language. But then when you come to the global south, um, I think the Indian sign language is like the only sign language that machine learning has been explored or has been utilized in a really good extent. Thing. Yeah. And uh, during our work, we realized that there was no work being done before on uh, the Southern African language. Yeah. And, um, we there was um I think because these so master students you know from um from uh South Africa I've forgotten the other university who worked on something like this but um he what he tried to do was just a proof of concept you know trying to um I mean created very few data sets I think um, about twenty seven works and then uh, you know built um, built a uh, model and then yeah. That, that was his master's thesis. And then there was a little um, literature, uh, there was a little study done by a uh, uh, Ghanaian, um, Ghanaian sign language enthusiast. Yeah. But um, we discovered that it, no large scale, I mean, impossible work have, have been done in any sub Saharan African country sign language. Well. So, yeah, we started um, trying to work in, the, um, in that uh, domain and then. You know, we started the entire uh, um, development pipeline, you know, having data sets and then labeling them and then starting to start the training. And then um, I realized during training that um, I, I needed help basically. I you know, like the lead investigator on this work. Um, most of the experiments, uh, just, you know, were mine to be done. So I joined the NL Collective. I was trying to join Collective. And, the, it's an open, open lab, you know, for seven motivated researchers from different parts of the globe, you know, to come together, you know, do their research. Okay, so um, ML Collective was very useful in um, trying to get feedback on this work. And then there was this point where I started needing uh, computational resources. So, uh, computational advance from uh, ML Collective. Yeah. And um, finally, there is uh, Naya Sena who was a math and statistics student at the University of Toronto then. So I met him by uh, ML Collective and then um, he volunteered to work on this project with us. And then, yeah, uh, it, it was very helpful, especially in the writing phase. I mean, I was targeting a conference deadline. So yeah, now I'm painting with a lot of writing expertise. We were able to get the work done, you know, for submission. And um, so we saw the paper published at, um, at the newest workshop for uh, on ML machine learning for the developing world, which that, that was last year in 2021. And then we improved on the initial submission and published the work as a conference paper at the International Agency Conference on Artificial Intelligence. That was around March, they said. Okay, so um I will learn a bit about the history of, you know, how, how the work came in play and then, you know, uh, how it set up. So, um, so uh, I'll go through the background, you know, the motivation, data set, and then the experiments, and then finally the demo. Yeah. So um, for the background, during, during our literature, we realized that, um, uh, wanted to, I mean, after discovering that gap where our work will fit in, we decided that we want to reduce the communication barrier between the young and gay community and the larger society with focus on um, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? And uh, it sort of makes sense because uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the region, you know, um, with, with some uh, species of uh, hearing disabilities. And it's also one of the regions with uh, the lowest number of resources that was solving this problem. So the lack of uh, solution in uh, 
for the lack of solution for this problem in Southern Africa is still for two reasons. The number one is that the silent data in the region is extremely low resource. Yeah. Uh, low resource, if, even, uh, of course, Masakane and, uh, and other relevant communities of, you know, try to work, I mean, try to bridge this gap in terms of uh, uh, natural languages, then they are, but in, in sign language, uh, for sign language cases, it was even worse, right? Because we, there was no existing data set for any of these options and African countries. Yeah. Um, and we also realized that there are complexities that uh, there are some complexity in trying to deploy these solutions in reliable environment. <laughs> For example, some solutions that we uh, investigated uh, seem to use the seem to utilize the uh, the use of uh, kinetic laws, you know, smart law. Uh, of course, trying to uh, put into consideration our budget to get this work done here, yeah, we cannot deal with such uh, complexities. I mean, it's like a personal project and then, I mean, an independent project, you know, running on personal resources, so we couldn't afford to, you know, to do that. Okay, so, um, so our approach was to, first of all, create a novel data set for a sub saharan African country sign language, yeah. And um, since I'm a Nigerian, so it makes sense to, you know, get started. Um, from from Nigeria, basically, yeah, and um, of course, Nigeria is like the most popular uh, African country. So I guess, um, of course, this, this is not based on any poor statistics, but uh, it, it's a. Uh, I think um, it might be a little bit safe, maybe not too well to assume that maybe we might have uh, more more hearing disability cases from uh, Nigeria. You know, being from Nigeria, being the in the uh, most popular uh, country in, in Africa. So our next step was to try and uh, do science-to-speech conversion experiments, you know, with several baseline models, more than later. And then finally deploy the best performing model for, for the users, you know, by, by converting the science test and words to, to speech. Okay, so uh, for the data set, over 8,000 images were, were created. And um, the first thing, and how that was done was that I have to you know, try and open up for people who might be interested in, you know, you know um, trying to um, create data set with us. And uh, apparently, I was able to get to the state market for Costa in one of the states in uh, in Nigeria, yeah, the state broadcasting corporation. So, um, uh, she, she, uh, Amanda, that's her name. So, Amanda was very willing, you know, to, to work with me on this uh, on this project and. Uh, yeah, so I created the initial, um, I created the initial, uh, the first part of the data set in, with Amanda, and then we, and then uh, I built the first iteration of the model, and then I took it to two special education schools, and um, of course, seeing the proof of concepts, they were quite enthusiastic about um, uh, helping me, you know, create a much larger data set, and that was how we arrived at 8,000, which is of course 135 plus. Styles and traces. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, uh, in the end, this was what we had. We had a widely dispersed uh, data set of 20 plus individuals, actually different in different background and life condition. You know, we're trying to account for how this model will be utilized. In, you know, it's very important that the model is able, the model is able to generalize. You know, generalize very well when exposed to. Uh, you know, uh, adjusting uh, background, adjusting lighting conditions, you know. So we have to, you know, put all these uh, into, into, uh, into consideration. So that means that uh, the data sets were, were, created in, uh, were created in different environments, you know, different backgrounds under different lighting conditions. Uh, okay, so after, uh, after, the, um, after we created the data set, I started clearing the data set. Uh, you know, some of the images were too blurry. Of course, we're trying to generalize, but yeah, uh, some of them were way too blurry. And then some of the images are not capturing the entire sign demonstration. You know, you have an image frame, and then we're trying to perform a sign in front of the image, uh, in front of the uh, in front of the webcam. Yeah. So there are times when you know the uh, sign that might be a little bit over and you know, uh, is answer. 
his bodies or body parts back on the time and sleep beyond the uh, the webcam view. Yeah. So such such images, you know, were were, were removed. And uh, yeah, so it's then IMP we annotate uh, the images for object detection in both text and XML format. Yeah. So um, if this is the first time you're hearing about um, object detection, I should say that I should say that um, object detection, as the name implies, means that we have um, we have we, we're planning we want to detect objects within an image frame. Right? So as you can see over here. This is an image frame, and then we have uh, you know several players, um, several players in the images in the image, and uh, we want to detect each of these uh, players of this in, as the label in, as as the label in time. You know we want to um, detect these people within uh, within the image frame. So the way to do that is that we have to notice the data set first. So that means that we draw a boundary box, as you can see here. We draw a boundary box around uh, around around um, the objects that we're trying to we're trying to detect. In in our own case, the objects we are trying to detect are the signs being performed by by our signers, right? So um, so what we had to do was to draw a boundary box and uh, and the signs that are being performed and the body parts that are performing signs here. Yeah. So there are some signs that you know we had to cover just the ends, and then there are some that we had to cover the faces. Yeah. For example, if you're trying to say somebody's beautiful, you're running your hand down your face, and um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful is running the back of your hand down your face. And, yeah. For something like that, we need to capture the entire face. If you're trying to say you're welcome, I mean, welcome, if you're putting your hand to your chest, or if, if you're saying sorry, you have to. Punch your arm into a fist and rub it over the chest. So something like that is across the chest. So uh, annotation to cover body and the uh, the chest on which you know the action is um, All right. So uh, moving on, the next the next uh, part I want to talk about is the uh, is the experimental process here. Yeah. So so for the for the experiment process, um, we tried a different models. Also, I was supposed to include an image here, but um, I was having bad internet, so I couldn't do that. Um, so, but I will try and explain as as best as uh, as best as I could do. Yeah. So we tried different models, three models actually. So the first one is uh, the YOLO D5 model, YOLO version five model. YOLO is an application for the um, the, the audience ones. And um, the way YOLO works is it employs a um, uh, convolutional neural network CNN detects objects in real time. So, as the name suggests, the algorithm requires just a smooth, a single forward propagation. Uh, propagation. And um, there's also the single shot, single shot detector using SNET 50 FPN or SSD for short. So, SSD also is a one shot object detection algorithm. So, so the way it works is that um, it's also tried to, you know, um, here's the idea, I sort of optimize for object different models that, that work very fast in real time. Yeah, so a little bit in some way, I prioritize efficiency. Uh, I, I prioritize the efficiency over accuracy, you know. There are other models like uh, AlgCNN that, um, that try to, um, Make predictions of learning in two stage approaches. So first of all, they try to you know learn the images, and then after that, they try to learn the uh, they try to learn the boundary boxes you know for the objects to be detected. But I sort of optimized for you know models that perform both both the um, both the um, that sort of uh, perform both the objects. Both the object detection and then the image classification in the in the single one. Yeah. Okay. So um yeah, so single shot detector also work uh, also works in similar ways as yellow, but maybe not as efficient as the yellow model. But I wanted to try out different base models. So yeah, so I tried it out. And then for the final model, I discarded the annotation. So I wasn't using the annotations, I was only using the images for image. You know, the usual 
dog and cat um, classifier, you know. So, but this time around is a, uh, I mean, we have like a uh, lot of labels of here, like 135 plus labels. So, <clears throat> so, so we discarded the annotation and then just trained using mobile net v2. Mobile net v2 is already a good trained um, image classifier, you know, on, um, on on the image net data set. So it's basically a stack of CNN layers. You know. um, so for the Yolo model, remember what I said about annotations, having to annotate, I mean, two boundary boxes and the uh, and the objects or signs that we're trying to detect. So for Yolo model, we made use of the test format annotations. And then uh, I tried out different data augmentation techniques. Uh, data augmentation, in this is the first time you're hearing about data augmentation, is it's all about trying to, you know, augment our data set. I mean, let's say we have a small corpus of data and then we realize that the data set might not be enough for, uh, might not be enough, you know, to, to achieve um, the kind of accuracy that we want on our, in our training, I mean, in our neural network training. Yeah, so data augmentation works in the sense that it creates synthetic data set with um, our original data, right? So that way we can easily multiply our data sets and yeah, our model can learn to uh, general, generalize more effectively, you know, uh, building a, a better accuracy baseline that way. So I tried out different methods. The first one was uh, the HSV manipulation, which is a uh, EU saturation of value. And it's basically talking about, you know, adjusting the lighting conditions of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the signs, I mean, of the, uh, data, yeah, and then the scaling, scaling is more zooming in and out, and then left to right flipping, which is more of um, flipping the images left to right, you know, the way you, um, the way you use your camera, and then, you know, you could flip the way you, uh, you flip the way you want to appear on your screen here. So I realized that, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to perform some signs, you know, in the, what's the name? On a particular hand, I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah. So, but it's it's sort of side side insensitive. So yeah, um, I tried out left right or flipping for that. Uh, and then finally, I trained over one hundred and fifty epochs in batch size of sixteen. I should also mention that for the yellow model, I made use of uh, the PyTorch framework for the development. Okay. So in the end, this was uh, what I had. Um, so you don't have to uh, concern yourself a lot with, the, uh, with all the charts here, but um, some that you might want to pay attention to is the precision score, which is around 87%. And then we have uh, the recall score, which is, which is around 98%. And then there's map at 0.5 and then map at 7.95. I'm, I'm going to explain in a bit. So this map is talking about the bond, uh, the boundary boxes um, uh, accuracy here. Map means a uh, main average precision, and at 0.5 means at 50% overlap. You know, we've drawn a, a boundary box, and then we're trying to predict a boundary box. So um, the model tried to um, match the predicted boundary box with the uh, with the true boundary box. Yeah. So the overlap at 0. Point, uh, at 50% is uh, is uh, 99%. But the overlap at 95%, you know, which is which means that the um, which means that the uh, the boundary boxes must be close to perfect to you know to the uh, to the two to the two uh, boundary box. Yeah, so so that was a bit low, you know. I had about uh, almost 70%, you know, of that. Uh, moving on, so for the uh, single shot detector model, I made use of uh, TensorFlow object detection API to assess and fine tune um, the SSD model that we used. Yeah, so it was already put in on, uh, on a large data set known as Poco, Poco 2017 data set. Um, so, okay, yeah, I mentioned that, yeah. So, because I was using TensorFlow of the detection API, I, I had to uh, convert the images and the annotations to TF records formats and um, and then I tried horizontal flipping and the copying as you know data augmentation techniques, and I trained across forty thousand steps. Okay, so for the final model, which was the mobile net v two, 
you know, it's, it's a classification model. So I discarded the annotations and I only trained with the um I only trained with the with the images. So in this instance, uh, one thing I tried out two different things. Well, the first thing I did was to uh, train across 60 epochs using mobile netv2 as a feature instruction. I'm going to explain it in a bit. With the feature instruction, uh, with feature instruction, we've already trained the base model, and then we are using that same model, you know, for uh, our prediction. So the only stuff that we are changing is the outer layer of the model, right? I mean, the layer that um, that uh, predicts the labels, yeah. So, so, so basically, what I did was to change the last layer. I mean, put a dense layer on top, and then, uh, and then have the model, you know, uh, predict my science here. So the accuracy was pretty bad. So I tried transfer learning, which means that I had to fine tune uh, some of the uh, layers in the model. Basically, uh, mobile v two has about one fifty two layers. So I fine tuned the fifty two layers, and I left the first hundred exposing. The, and then I trained that was 140 epochs. In the end, this was what I had. And you realize that uh, looking at this this green line, uh, the mark, the notes where uh, where the models started functioning, and then you're going to see that the loss decreased rapidly. I didn't, I, I still don't know what happened here, but the loss decreased rapidly, you know, rapidly. You know, the same for accuracy, accuracy uh, goes sharply, and the same for precision, and then same for recall, you know. It was like a sharp increase after I started um, trying to know. All right, so in the end, this was uh, my evaluation scores across all the, all the three baseline models. Yeah, and you notice that um, Yolo performed the best. One thing I noticed about the SSD model when I tried deploying it was that it has this weird habit of um, imagining shapes in, in, uh, in poor lighting conditions, yeah. So, I mean, if you have like a very dark background, then it might imagine, I don't know, hello or something out of the dark background. <laughs> that was a bit funny. Yeah, so uh, I deployed the uh, the yellow model. You know, I was converting the sign faces of the sign images to uh, to to speech, uh, to test basically. So I had to convert the test to speech. And I did that with um, PyTTXT. So PyTTXT, PyTTXT is like a, a Python library for, you know, for test-to-speech conversion, yeah. And then I deployed the model on Docker with Docker and this stack uh, server. Um, you don't need to bother too much if this is the first time you're hearing about Docker. But it's basically like a, a container for like an application. So you don't have to, um, if you want to use an application on your local server, you don't need to install all the dependencies. Um, yeah, so you could just, uh, you could just download the Docker file and then you know run the Docker file and you have the application. Yeah. So uh, so finally, I I plan on showing you a demo on this talk, um, but I don't know if my internet will be up for for this. Yeah. Um, okay, it looks like it's up for it. So on the left hand side, I have um, I have the the server running, and then on the no, that, that was on the right hand side, sorry. And on the left hand side, you can see different files. There's live feed detection, image detection. So I ran the live feed detection and then it automatically spins up my uh, webcam. Yeah. So it's trying to detect sign in the image frame. Yeah. So now it can, when I perform a sign, uh, it detects it. I hope you can hear the A, B, or uh, sound. B. C, 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 D, 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 F. Okay, so that, that was me trying to, you know, trying to uh, perform the, the science, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, getting votes. Okay, I was trying to form a sentence here. I am, I am sorry, yeah. So I, okay. One thing you shouldn't mind is, you know, uh, the amount of time it takes to, you know, repeat each of those words. I'm, I'm not an expert signer, so I'm a little bit slow with the way I sign. Yeah. So, and of course, the, the, um, the model is looking for a sign, you know, at each 
at each image frame, which is like, you know, I don't know, two or three seconds. Yeah. So if I'm performing a single sign like high across a um, lot of image frames, and it gets repeated, you know, for as long as I'm holding that, um, that uh, as long as I'm performing that single sign. Yeah. I don't know if that's the, But one thing I want to, I want you to notice from this particular part is that one, I wasn't part of the uh, data set creation. And then this background has never been seen before by this particular model. And I don't know if you could say the light over here, but um, uh, the light was intentionally there so as to distort the, um, the science to some extent. You know, I was just basically trying to test how well this model could perform in the wild. And yeah, it, it did that really, really well. Yeah, I was quite, I was quite satisfied. <laughs> quite satisfied, you know, when um, it was able to do this uh, successfully. Yeah. Um, moving on. So the data set creation was very hectic. Apart from the fact that you know I was creating it with my personal resources, which wasn't easy. You know, trying to trying to secure the interest of stakeholders who will be willing to um, create the data set for me. You know, I'm not a governmental organization. I'm, I'm just, I'm just one person. Yeah, I mean, and then, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still quite young. Yeah, I'm still in my early 20s. So um, yeah, it's, it's normal for people not to take me too serious, you know, <laughs> even I don't take myself too serious. Okay, so, um, so trying to interest people in, in creating the data set for this was very, was a bit difficult, you know, and then, uh, but when Amanda, the TV side, but uh, sign up with Broadcaster, created the first um, batch of the data sets for me, and I was able to create a proof of concept, I think it became easier from there on, yeah, but another hectic part was the data sequestration is that it said, you know, while I was at the school, of course, the schools were very kind, you know, dedicating, you know, a whole day or half day, you know, for me to create the data set with the students and teachers. But um, I, I, I mean, there are like a lot of students and then we need to create, I mean, each, 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 each sign up, you know, takes about, um, I think one and a half hour, you know, to create, um, to create a batch of this data set. Yeah. Because, um, of course, the person has to sit in front of a laptop for, uh, why creating, I don't know, 135 sequences of, I think 137 was their channel, but 137 sequences of a uh, sequence of, uh, of different sign words. Yeah, so th there is like a prompt on the screen and then, yeah, it starts creating and then the webcam is clicking away, you know. Um, and um, having them to sit still for, I don't know, one hour plus, that, that was that was a bit, uh, a bit crazy. And then, um, of course, I had a lot of people to, you know, to create the data set. I mean, after the first question, yeah, so I basically had a lot of people, but very few resources to do that. So what I had to do was to, you know, um, borrow my friends' laptops, you know, yeah. So I think I had about three or four laptops and then have, um, have my, have the students and teachers, you know, sit in front of those laptops, taking, taking turns to, um, to create the data set. Yeah, that was, that was really hectic. Yeah, so in the end, I think I, I spent about, uh, for the data set question, I spent about, uh, well, well, I mean, when I, I, I had secured my, um, I, I had secured my, you know, I mean, people will be willing to uh, <coughs> create the data set. I think it took about uh, three or four weeks. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that was a bit hectic. And uh, the data annotation was even more hectic because I had to, you know, go to 1000 images manually and trying to draw boundary boxes around the images, you know, one after the other. And, um, and of course, trying to label them perfectly. So that, that was really hectic. I couldn't really automate that. Um, someone from my colleagues tried to link me up with uh, an automated data annotation company, but I guess the charges were way, were way too much. So yeah, we didn't push through with that. Um, and then, yeah, so finally, the data set release has been something that has been on my mind for a long while, but I haven't really paid more attention to it these days. Yeah. So I haven't been able to release the data set publicly. When we submitted uh, the paper to this uh, new workshop, of course, the reviewers to a lot of helpful comments and uh, one of the suggestions or questions was about uh, how we plan to uh, 
protect the identity of the signers, you know. And that, that's a little bit, that's a more of a conundrum actually, because um, the face is like an integral part of, um, is like an integral part of, you know, trying to uh, create, create, create um, I mean, trying to perform sign language, uh, signs there. Uh, for example, A and M um, is just, just taking out the form. Yeah. But the difference between A and M um, is that M um, is on your lips and um, A is uh, any other, any other part of the screen, yeah, but not on your lips. Yeah, so something like that. The lips is actually an integral part of, you know, uh, of uh, identifying arm. Another one is smile and frown. Uh, both of them involve you running your hand down your cheek. And, um, and if uh, the, uh, if the, uh, the face, if the face is like grayed out, then um, our model might not, might, it, it might actually cause a degradation, you know, in terms of model performance. Yeah, so uh, so those are, those are the good blocks, you know, that you know really um, really um, you know <laughs> cost lots of uh, issues basically. Yeah. So right now I'm not I I, have, I don't know what to do here with the data set with this, but I, I'm hoping to find a solution. So finally, thanks to ML Collective for the computational resources. I used to tell people of my it's, it's more like um, it's more like a war story, right? <laughs> because um, I there's when I was creating the initial um, initial batch of the of my models, yeah, there was a day, a particular day, I had to stay stand in front of a Google Colab, you know, uh, and then spend for like uh, thirteen hours. If you are not familiar with the Google Colab, Google Colab is more like an interactive uh, integrated development environment. Yeah, so it has to be interactive. You have to keep using it for it to keep running. Yeah. So there's no how I could just leave my model to train, you know, and then just uh, just just go and do something else. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was that was that was really beautiful. <laughs> but thanks to the from collective, I had the post in it. I had like um the computational uh, like we just do a lot of for, for the rest of the training. Um yeah, so this is something that I realized after working on this, on this, on this, and um it's about the one-sidedness of, of this work. In fact, I didn't really take note of it until I was interviewed. I was interviewed, you know, uh, on this work. Yeah. So um, the idea is that um, this work is extremely one-sided in the idea that while it uh, it improves how we communicate with the signers, but it does not necessarily improve how the signers uh, on the standards. I don't know if that makes sense to you. By Translated science, yeah. We're learning, what's the name? We're learning, um, we're trying to learn. I mean, we're trying to understand what the signers are saying, but it doesn't necessarily improve, you know, how the signers understand us. Because of course they can they can't uh, really they can't they can hear our speech, I mean, due to the hearing disabilities. Uh, but um but maybe a rationalization would be the fact that um, most some of them, or most, I would say, I don't have any uh, supporting statistics for this, but there's the assumption that yeah, they could read and write, you know. So uh, maybe this is not necessarily a limitation, you know, in the sense that they can uh, they can read and write, and uh, yeah, so the yeah. But I, a part of me wish that you know maybe uh, there's a way we could improve on our uh, signers from the standards. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, thank you very much um, for trying to take your time to uh, listen this, to this talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. This has been a really wonderful um, presentation and discussion. It's really, I learned a lot about sign languages and the importance of sign languages in NLP. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's not it hasn't been getting much traction in you know, people. I think that's changing a lot. And Chester also can attest to it with the ACL paper he talked about. Um, so uh, we have the sign languages channel to foster discussions on sign languages in NLP. So that's creating data sets, um, that's um, discussing the models, the modeling. So I would, I hope to see some good and interesting projects coming out of this space. Thank you so much once again, Stephen, for this amazing talk.